three seconds. You good? All right, welcome, welcome to the first meeting of the Mayor's Immigration Task Force. Uh, it's great to be with you all this morning. Um, as most of you know, I'm Shauna Singh Huey. I'm chairing this task force and excited to spend some time with you until our 60 day deadline, uh, which is December 13th. So that's something that we will keep top of mind. Uh, but looking around, it's really great to see what a wonderful group of leaders this new mayor has selected to serve on his first task force. And that is, that's a weighty place to be, right? Sitting on his first task force. Um, but we fortunately have a very specific job to do. We know that December 13th, we are to deliver to the mayor a report that is limited in scope. We are to lay out in our report descriptions of Metro Department's current practices and policies related to immigration enforcement, potentially make some suggestions about how those requests are reported to the mayor's office, and also provide an overview in our report about some of the best practices, or maybe if we like, some practices to avoid uh, from peer cities. So what's good to know as we start this is that our role is to lay a solid foundation for future policy making. It's not to do that policy making, but it's to make sure that policymakers have all the tools that they need to make smart informed decisions that are in the best interest of our community. Uh, I really wanna thank the mayor and his staff who's here somewhere uh, for keeping our role that specific uh, and giving us some really clear guidelines um, and for inviting us each to the table around an issue that I know means a lot individually to each of us and to our organizations. I also want to welcome all of the folks who've come um, to watch this and it, it's great to have other folks here and Mary Falls you have arrived at exactly the perfect time. No you're perfect. Uh, I just gave a quick welcome and now I'll turn it over to you. Um, thanks everybody for coming. We need you. Uh, we, need, we need all of your voices. Um, um, the scope of work that um, this group is tasked with is um, before you all, I believe. Um, this was very intentionally designed um, uh, to respond to concerns from all of the constituents at the meeting today and the communities we represent, um, really trying to clarify um, um, what are best practices um, around the issues um, that we're addressing today, and then um, making our communities feel safe and valued, um, and m making sure that we're not, we're staying in our lane as a city, um, and not um, impinging on state and federal uh, laws. So we're grateful you're here. Um, hopefully we can do the work quickly, and uh, find really wonderful policies going forward so that um, the purposes of the task force are accomplished quickly. That's really the goal. We can get clarification um, out to the communities right away. If you guys could read each other's minds. We are so good at this. <laughs> Mary, hey. I believe that's your style. Oh, no, 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 not at all. Yeah. Hey, I am, um, thank you all, each one of you, for being here. Oh, this, we need a microphone. Thank you, Donna. I'm just making him happy. Um, uh, well, yes. Um, Hey, I just wanted to spend a moment and thank each of you for being thoughtful and representing a different part of our government and of Nashville that needs to find the right solutions to this complicated problem. Um, our legal director is starting, Mary, a week from Monday, uh, who will be a big addition to this group too. Not that you don't have a very fine lawyer or two here already. Um, several, in fact, and a CPA. Um, <laughs> And again, uh, I want to thank the two council members in particular for being here. Uh, again, it needs to be a complete solution for our whole county. And I'm grateful to all of you having specific um, things that you need, you know, that it's, it's going to have to be effective for everybody for it to work out. But again, thank you for doing this. I want to thank our chair lady. I want to thank Mary Falls um, also for being the mayor's office liaison with this group and 60 days is this enough time okay we'll make it work and I'm grateful and again I'm grateful to deputy chief and to the sheriff and to Tory and I know judge Escobar to get all the aspects of local government on the same page about what is the right policy for our whole community all right you will have a lot of work to do so I better 
actually, if I actually get to go to a chili cook-off um, for olives, but it's 100 years. So any restaurant that's lasted for 100 years deserves to have a mayor come by and, and certify how wonderful it is for Nashville <laughs> to have that. Okay, appreciate it so much. Grateful, grateful to everybody. Thank you. Tis the season for chili, right? It's a little early for chili. <laughs> That was 6. Yeah. I, don't, I don't get the pick. Thanks. Um, all right. So before we get down to business, I thought it would be good if we all um, introduced ourselves. Um, and so here's my special. I promise not to make you do any like weird icebreakers or anything. Um, but here, here is my request to you. In addition to your name and your organization, here's our thought exercise. So say it's December 13th, which is our 60-day deadline, and we just turn into the mayor's office our final report which describes the state of our city with respect to our current policies and practices related to immigration enforcement in metro departments so we turn in this great probably not graphically designed but otherwise very solid report to the mayor's office here's my question for you how will having this information or having had the opportunity to share this information with our city make your job easier and i, I regret that i did not prep any of you for that, so I will let you think about it. How will, so we turn in this report, it describes the state of our city, how does it make your life better for your organization, or if you've been able to maybe share this information in a way that you haven't been able to share it before, how does that make your job easier? Um, so I'll start to give you a second to think about this. So as many of you know right now, I run a nonpartisan think tank called Think Tennessee, but really, um, a lot of my passion for this comes from my former job, which is as the director of the mayor's office of New Americans under Mayor Dean. So I spent about four and a half hours, four and a half years, way more, at least four and a half hours sitting in this specific chair, um, but lots of time sitting back there. Um, and I got to really understand what an impact metro departments have on Nashvilleians' day to day lives. I mean, I see so much how the way that our metro departments operate ha really impacts quality of life for folks so much more so sometimes than whatever you read in the headlines of the national paper might right uh, and so i'm excited about the opportunity for folks in our city to have clarity around our current practices um, and to know that if some of those practices need to be updated then we've taken the first step toward that hank i'm going to put you on the spot yeah I'm Hank Clay. Uh, I get to support the students and teachers at the MMPS as the chief of staff for the school district. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Battle is very interested in this and she is at home with her newborn baby, so thank you all for letting me come. Dr. Battle and the school district care deeply about serving all students. And at the bare minimum, that means having them there present and able to focus on getting a great education, which is hard enough. It means having families who um, are able to come and visit their students and support the work of the school. And it means having a staff who understands um, what their responsibilities are reacting to outside forces um, so that they can ensure that all students are getting that great education. So that's what I would love, what I would love to see coming out of this. Thanks, Hank. Hey, and I forgot one logistical note. If you could, for the folks in the room with the cameras and the recording devices, when you're speaking, if you could make sure that one of the mics is sort of close, that would make them happy. Thanks, guys. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Catherine Harkham, and I am the legal director at the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition, which is a mouthful, so we just say Turk. Uh, I, prior to doing this, I spent 14 years working in as a Metro employee at the Public Defender's Office, and in that role for about the past five or six years, I best or I focused on representing uh, non-citizen or immigrant defendants. So I am intimately familiar with the ways that our criminal legal system here in Nashville affects and interacts with the immigrant community. Uh, because of the extent of my tenure there, I am also pretty familiar with the changes in those interactions over the past 14, 15 years. Now in my role at Turk, I am delighted to be able to sort of directly address some of these issues head on. I am thrilled to be here, and thank you to Shauna and the mayor for, who's not here anymore, or Mary, for uh, including me and including Turk at the table. What I hope will come out of this is, as we have seen this summer, um, there is just a, a sort of unknown patchwork of responses, 
across various city agencies. Um, and what that leads to is a lot of fear and uncertainty in the community. Uh, the immigrant community is a very powerful and strong force in Nashville, but when this community feels unable to interact with the government through the criminal legal system, through the school system, through the health system, through whatever, it creates problems for all of us and it creates a weaker community as a whole. So I'm going to sort of echo Shauna and say that I hope coming out of this we can reach some clarity about what the city's or what individual department responses are and that then we can use that uh, ultimately to tailor, create some policies for Nashville which will strengthen the community as a whole by enabling every member of our community to fully invest in Nashville and to fully take advantages of the services and resources that our great city has to offer. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Zolfa Atsuara. I'm a council member at large. Um, what I would like to see as somebody who ran on in Nashville for all and who looking at my votes see that it's a, a very diverse uh, group of people that supported it would actually love to see a city where everyone uh, is not afraid to interact with the government uh, and everyone feels rested and welcome. Proud to be a council person, I was the chair of the American Muslim Advisory Council and I work with all the mosques in the state including those in Nashville. And so what I've seen from experience is that when the instructions is not very clear, when it's subjective, then you see people applying rules in a way that might impact people that are not supposed to be there. I witnessed, I read in this town, that uh, someone who was a U.S. citizen was picked up. And so what I would like to see is coming out of this, understanding what the process is so that everybody knows what to expect and to know what is being done so that it's clearly communicated to all involved and people don't have to fear of being subjected to arbitrary rules. So that's what I would love to see. I'm Mike Hager, I'm on the city Metro Police Department. Happy to be here. Uh, as the others have said, as we all seek to strengthen this community and have a community for all, it's important that we are effectively as a police department able to engage everyone here. So a better informed officer can better do that job. So I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone. So I'm uh, Darren Hall, the sheriff here. Um, so I've been in this about 30 years and uh, I've been elected, I guess, the last 20. I went to college for some reason to do this job. Um, and 30 years ago, uh, we didn't talk about immigration and mental health. Um, and so what's become clear to me is as, you know, the issues of our community evolve, so too shall we, and, and figuring out what that is along the way is is our challenge. That's really what I think we all are challenged by in anything we're doing. Um, I think, I think, and, and I'm interested in hoping that what we can do to, is to help the people who aren't ever gonna be in this room, and that's the employees and some of them are making very low wages to make decisions that ought to be clear. Uh, we've experienced that here in, in the last many years, and it's difficult to watch <coughs> when there's not clear direction and, and, and um, to, to people who don't make enough money to, to be put into the, to the spotlight of making you know difficult choices. So our, our employees in Metro deserve clarity, uh, and I hope that's what we're able to do moving forward to, to help not only our community at large, but the people who we pay to, to work in our government. So my hope is that we can help them along the way. Thank you. I'm Tori Johnson. Uh, currently, I'm a law professor at Belmont, uh, but before that, for nearly 27 years, I was the district attorney in Nashville. and would just simply echo what uh, what Darren says. Uh, you know, I, I spent a, a large part of my career in and around criminal the criminal system, and uh, saw it go from where we were the, the immigrant popul population was uh, very small, and uh, to see it grow and grow and grow and become more and more diverse, which means that the criminal justice system has to deal with not only people charged with a crime but people who have been victimized as well. Uh, and and as in doing that, saw uh, a lot of the practical effects of of the way immigration was or was not enforced, uh, the the different interests that the state, the federal government, and local government have, and so anything that we can do here to bring some 
degree of clarity would be, I think, helpful uh, for all the reasons that everyone else has expressed around the table. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Juliana Ospina-Cano, the Executive Director of Conexión Americas, and I'm delighted to be here not only as um, the leader of an organization that serves 9,000 immigrant origin families on an annual basis, but we also serve about 800 students in the K-12 space. Um, and also as a woman, as an immigrant, a newly arrived immigrant to Nashville from Washington, D.C., <laughs> I am excited to um, see how we can not only collaborate, but more importantly, bring clarity to the current situation. Uh, at Conexión Americas, we have the honor and privilege of having the trust of newly arrived immigrants, but also immigrant origin families that have been in Nashville and Tennessee for many, many years. Not all the families that we served are newly arrived. Many of them lived in mixed status families and have deep roots in Tennessee and in Nashville. So uh, coming to a place where we can collaborate, bring clarity, and tease out policies and specific pieces that is, are going to allow us to provide guidance as we have trusted information from the families that come into our building and our, pro and our programs. Because we work with families not only in education, but in some areas that really highlight the economic um, impact that immigrant origin families have in Nashville, Tennessee. So I'm looking forward to a very productive conversation. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Councilwoman Sandra Sepulveda. I represent District 30. I am the first Latina woman elected to the Metro Council. Um, so the youngest current council member. <laughs> so, um, you know, I know I don't just represent District 30. Um, being the only uh, Latina council member, I represent all Latinos in the city. And that is something that Zolfat probably understands. Um, and so what I want to see are tangible solutions because I get calls from all over the city um, with issues that, you know, uh, residents are having. I want to make sure that my constituents aren't afraid to call law enforcement and don't have to go knock on their neighbor's door because they're afraid that, uh, you know, something bad's going to happen to them and their family. So I want to walk away with tangible solutions. I'm not on the task force, but as the person responsible for pulling it together, um, I just want to point out the obvious. You all were selected very carefully for being thoughtful problem solvers. Um, and in all the conversations um, that we've been having for the last couple of months, um, it was clear that there was um, a, a uniform uh, need for information and, and clarification of um, um, who's responsible for what and uh, how we communicate that uh, among ourselves and to the public. Um, and the other thing that nobody's mentioned actually that I think is as valuable um, as everything else that's been mentioned is you all need to have relationships with each other. Y you all are problem solvers in our community at the very highest levels. And um, you all need to be in relationship with each other so that you can feel comfortable calling each other um, when you have concerns uh, that matter. Um, so I would hope that would also be an outcome of this. And then, of course, having a very short uh, time frame on this was very intentional. Um, you all are super busy. We wanted, um, we wanted to get the A-team at the table, and we couldn't do that if we had anything that had a huge time frame. Um, but we can achieve the goals that you all have articulated, um, and that is the um, direction for this task force in short order because you all personally are at the table. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, and I need to get to work. Thank you. Um, I want to also recognize Judge Anna Escobar. She is on the bench right now, or she'd be with us. It seems like a pretty legitimate excuse. <laughs> um, so hopefully, um, and we'll get to some scheduling stuff at the end, but we will not have every meeting at this time. Um, so hopefully we can get Judge Escobar's input as well. Um, and just really excited to have 
all of you around the table. Like Mary said, it's a, it's a great group. And before we get to the meat of it, I thought it would be important for us to set the stage around two topics in particular. Um, so we'll start with an overview. Cindy Gross from Metro Legal is here um, to help walk us through what a department, a Metro department is and what a Metro department is not. And one little spoiler, uh, it's a lot trickier than you might think. Uh, Cindy's here to help clarify that for us. Uh, and then I'm gonna ask Juliana to share a little bit of information about Tennessee's immigrant community and Nashville's immigrant community specifically. So we can just get a baseline understanding of the number of Nashvilleians that Metro Department's policies and practices could impact directly. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cindy. Cindy, thank you so much for being here. I've worked here for 13 years, um, but as part of this project to help you all, um, it's, uh, it's been helpful even for me to learn, even having worked here for so long, about the structure of the metropolitan government. And so just to provide a general overview, um, our city is based on the Metropolitan Charter, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, so it was created by the Charter, and it sets forth um, generally what Metro consists of, which includes the mayor, the council, the judges, the departments, boards, and commissions, and the officers, agency boards um, that are created additionally by the Constitution or the laws of the state of Tennessee. So we have obviously entities that are created by the charter and later by our Metro code, passed by council legislation, by ordinance. Um, but, you know, metro government, when we think of it, is broader than that. It includes the criminal justice system, the judges, the, the council, and even um, offices that are created by our state law, our state constitution, and our state statutes. So, again, in the charter, it sets forth um, under the mayor's role that the mayor um, is the it has the executive and administrative power over the metropolitan government. Um, it, it exercises those over metro departments, boards, commissions, officers, and agencies that are created and authorized in the charter. It's, uh, the mayor is responsible for the conduct of the executive and administrative work of the metropolitan government and for law enforcement within its boundaries. So if we're thinking about kind of the departments that fall under, generally under the authority of the mayor's office um, under the charter, this sets it forth that the mayor is authorized to administer, supervise, and control the departments created by the charter. Um, and then I wanna highlight the middle part that off by uh, commas here, it says, except as otherwise specifically provided in the charter. So, as Shauna was saying, it's not just that a department was created by the charter. When we're looking at the authority for who's in charge of supervising each department, you actually have to go read each charter section because there are exceptions that are otherwise provided in the charter for who's in control of a department. Um, so, but in general, if a department is created by the charter or created by an ordinance, it falls under um, the mayor's authority. But again, um, you do have to actually go to each department in the charter and look how it's described as to who actually controls the department and the employees within the department. Um, and as we know, the mayor appoints members to various boards and commissions, um, but those boards and commissions have their own authority that's set forth in our charter and code. Okay, so um, as I said, there are metro departments that are created by our charter. They include finance, police, fire, public works, water services, the Metro Clerk's Office, and the Department of Law. But um, as I said, to pay attention to the except as otherwise provided, just for an example, for the Department of Law where I work, if you actually go read the charter section, it says that Department of Law is under the control of the Director of Law, um, and, the, and the Department of Law controls the law work for the government. 
Um, so um, it's, it's a little more nuanced than just that it's in the charter um, as far as falling under the mayor's um, authority. And similarly, you, can, you all, I know, understand with the police department, they have state law authority as well. Um, there are a host of metro departments that were also established by ordinance. Um, and you can find um, uh, provisions related to them in the Metro Code of Laws. That's the separate section in the charter. Um, this includes this list of departments. So again, as far as in general, they would, these departments would fall under um, the mayor's umbrella. Um, but you'd have to go look specifically at each one and its regulations for um, who controls its work. So moving on to kind of separate agencies that are, um, have their own separate boards that are, you know, uh, provide authority for them, includes NES, MDHA, Sports Authority, Election Commission, and then the big ones here, Metro National Public Schools, we're familiar with, has their own board of education that oversees the Metro National Public Schools. Um, similarly, the health department has their own board, um, and the hospital authority ha um, provides the, the control and supervision over the hospital. Okay, so also separate from just metro departments, we have metro boards and commissions, and um, they have their own authority under our Metro Charter and Code. Um, here's some of them. There's a lot of boards and commissions. As you peruse the Charter and the Code, you'll find a lot of them. See, the list keeps going. <laughs> they have their own authority again under the Charter and Code. Okay, and then the final kind of category of metro departments um, uh, relate to where there's um, separate state law authority for these positions, um, whether it's in the state constitution or state statute that provides for these positions and these departments. So this would include all of our judges, um, the courts, the clerks, district attorney, the public defender, the sheriff, register of deeds, metro trustee, assessor of property. So these groups um, are, are, have separate authority that's based in state law. <coughs> They're not just created by the metro charter and code. So here's my conclusion, um, that this was hopefully helpful to give you a general overview of Metro as a whole um, and how it's structured. So we have a lot of departments that are created by our Metro Charter or by ordinance and that they would generally be under supervision of the mayor's office. But again, as it relates to any specific um, you know, policy that's going to come out of this task force, um, it would be, um, and we're happy to help to like run it by the Department of Law and we could look at to whether there's any sort of exceptions that would make it not to apply to a certain department. Um, and then boards and commissions have their own separate authority. Elected officials, clerks, judges, sheriff, district attorney's <coughs> office, they do have their own separate authority under state law. Um, and so again, Department of Law is happy to help and read the charter and code for you all some more if, you, if that would be helpful. Thank you so much, Cindy. Really okay, appreciate you're it. You're welcome. All right, so it's good to know they're there, so we can always ask about those separate, uh, you know, otherwise provided categories. Um, and Juliana, I wonder if I might turn it over to you now to give us an overview of uh, the immigrant community in Nashville. Thank you. And again, um, as I mentioned, Juliana Ospina with Acción Americas, and I have the the task of uh, providing an overview of immigrant origin families and migrant families in Nashville and Tennessee in less than seven minutes so I will try my best um, to to do it consistently and 
The most important thing that I would like to highlight is the fact that immigrant origin families are part of our fabric, who we are as a state and who we are as a city. So I'm going to provide with some um, specific statistics and then I'll pass some documents over so you can take home for homework so we can have more clarity when we come back in our next meeting. So in Tennessee, let's start uh, with the big landscape. About 5.2 of Tennesseans, Tennesseans are foreign born, so the demographics have been changing, but about 183,000 children in Tennessee have one or more foreign born parents. This means that one of their parents was not born in the United States. Um, in addition, when we look about governance and trust, which is something that we want to focus as part of this task force, about 27,000 children in Tennessee were born outside the United States and again have one parent that wasn't born in this country. So many of these children and families, as I mentioned earlier, lived in mixed status households, but also international households where, yes, they are, have roots in Nashville and Tennessee, but also have deep connections to their family's country of origin. And I can think about our Kurdish uh, brothers and sisters who have deep ties and roots here in Nashville and Tennessee, while also keeping an eye and a heart into what's happening in, in the larger scale at an international level. If we look specifically at Nashville, and this is important to us as we look into the city that we're building, we love and we want to make sure that we protect. Uh, when we look at students in Metro Public Schools, and Hank, I know you're very familiar with these data, about 26% of Metro Public School students are Latino. So when we look at the diversity, not only of thought, of demographics, but also that representation that we have in our schools, it's also important when we think about language and access to information. When we don't have clarity when it comes to serving the students that we have in our schools, the families and the parents that come into our buildings, then we have um, an issue there. The same thing is about 36% of national public schools come from a house where language, um, a, 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 a language other than English is spoken at home. And this is very important because that's where organizations like Turk, Conexion America is coming to play when we are the ones distilling the information that they're hearing in the community, that they're hearing in the school system, and they come to us for that trusted so source of information. In addition, about 12% of, of Nashvillians were born outside the United States, and about one out of three are naturalized citizens. So for Conexion Americas, when we think about next year, 2020 civic engagement, this is also very important because many of us, many of them will be able to vote and be part of our fabric in that specific piece. And lastly, um, lastly, the thing that I wanted to communicate to all of you is an invitation is to think about the nuanced fabrics of immigrant origin families. Yes, as I mentioned, we see families, newly arrived immigrants that come into our buildings every day but we also have a host of families that have been here for a very long time. On November the 12th, the Supreme Court is going to be hearing oral arguments for DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And this is an example of how some stressors that are part of the immigrant origin families that live in our neighborhoods are present in their day-to-day -day lives. For many of these families, in about 7,000, 8,000, I would say, DACA recipients in Tennessee, they're counting on these oral arguments for folks to highlight their nuanced lives on a day-to-day -day basis. What it would mean for them if they were able to go to work, get a driver's license, and be active participants um, in our society. So it's just an example of how something as DACA is something that really permeates in our society and issues and stressors that are colleagues, many of them are teachers, nurses, doctors, our neighbors, friends, and family, and more importantly, children that are part of our fabric. Um, and again, this is an invitation, if we look at governance and trust and clarity, to look not only at immigrants from a deficit perspective, but the opposite, from an asset-based perspective, as our neighbors, community partners, children, and more importantly, the demographic in Nashville in 2040, when one out of three is going to be from an immigrant origin family. So again, I look forward to focusing more in terms of what we're going to do next as we continue to champion um, not only safety, but more importantly, the nuanced lives that immigrant origin families have in Nashville. I will pass around um, the statistics, and I hope that we can have more time to discuss this with more time um, in the future. Juliana, mm -hmm. um, I neglected to allow you any time to ask Cindy questions about the 
uh, nuances of the Metro code. And so while we've got you, Cindy, I did want to open up. If anybody's got questions for Cindy or Juliana, if you don't mind, too, uh, now would be a great time. Anybody wanting to dive deeper into the Metro code? Yeah. yeah uh, so Cindy, on the PowerPoint list of elected officials, I um, would have a school board to that. The school board is elected, of course, and um, I'm sure there's oversight, but I just want to make sure everything's clear about that. And then, so, Sean, was the origin of that to really distinguish, you know, if we're going to do something that applies to the whole city, that there's different kind of channels to be able to distribute that, and it can't be done in just one action? Is that? Exactly, Hank. Okay. Yes. And so, in a second, we're going to talk about the information that we want to learn about the way that policies and practices currently exist in metro departments. And I thought it would be useful to understand what a metro department was. So we might decide we want to ask, you know, any organization we can, you know, send an email to about their policies and practices. But I think it's important that we know sort of who's obligated to respond to us and who, you know, might but doesn't have to, and then who's just totally outside of our jurisdiction. So maybe that's overly legalistic, but I think it's an important distinction, Hank. Do you mind, Cindy? Is, You're welcome um, to use the PowerPoint. Okay, I'm glad that it's helpful. It is helpful. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, would you mind if we shared it with the members of the task force so that they've got it? Um, sure. So I, I can do that. I've got it from you. I just want to make sure that. So I'll make sure that you all get an email with that, too, because this will be relevant as we move forward, too. I don't know if Metro Legal or anyone can even answer this, but, but with the Mayor Browley's executive order, uh, what, a few weeks back or months back, um, there was, and again, I read it, but I, there was exceptions listed in pretty big detail, meaning, you know, it applies here, not in the S. I mean, does Metro Legal know if that's where that came from? And I'm not trying to get into politics of it. What I'm trying to figure out is the exceptions to his order, can we? And, and I have not recently reviewed that order, but I know you will see, for example, in the Metro Code, a, a good example is who has to provide disclosures like um, under the ethics ordinance, but it'll accept out certain groups, like NES, you know, is a common exception. So um, there, are, there are executive orders and there are parts of the code that will, you know, put forth a requirement for Metro departments that say, you know, if this only applies to um, departments created by the charter or elected officials in departments created by the charter as opposed to state law and such. So that, that probably a similar language was in the cap one. Um, so I wonder if we could for that, would you mind just flipping back and getting your slides up? Cindy, can we? Sure. Do, just so we can see the, I think we want probably the one that is the Metro Department's one. Um, and while we're figuring out the logistics of that, for Juliana, I'm sure that sh you're happy to take questions. Juliana, too, does anybody have questions about those stats or anything? Great. Well, I know we've got copies to take home with us, too, so Juliana, thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to open up my laptop now to symbolize that we're going to get down to work, and I actually do want to um, work on putting together with you all uh, a list of questions. So per the scope of work that you see in front of you, um, we know that we're in charge of writing a report that does two, that reports on two separate but related topics, right? So one is really about reporting. We know that we are tasked with explaining the current policies, practices, trainings that relate to reporting to the mayor's office, for, to Metro departments reporting to the mayor's office when they have had requests from federal immigration authorities. So it really is like, who do you call and within how long, right? So there's a reporting piece, and then there's also a compliance piece. So the compliance piece is, you know, how do you respond to requests from federal immigration authorities? What are your current policies, practices, trainings? How do you communicate that to your constituents, to your residents? So again, two separate but related topics, reporting and compliance. Uh, and we know that in our report, we've got to explain you know, what the current policies and practices are with, with respect to both reporting and compliance. So I feel like we better ask Metro departments what they are. Uh, so I was hoping that we could work together just over the next little bit here um, to come up with a list of questions that we want to ask Metro departments. And, you know, again, thanks to Cindy, I think we have a better understanding of, you know, 
sort of in whose job description is it to respond to us, and then there are other folks that we can ask, um, but we, sh we need to know that they don't necessarily, they're not required to respond. And then, you know, I wasn't even, to be honest, thinking about boards and commissions and those sorts of things, but we might want to sort of delineate, you know, who do we want to survey, and then are there groups, like I'm just gonna say the Metro Historic Commission off the top of my head, right? The groups that maybe don't have employees, or, or we can decide together, right? Like which, which slides there, who do we want to poll about that, about their practices with respect to reporting and compliance? And Mary has so kindly offered tomorrow at, we used to call it department heads, Mary, I don't know what you're calling it, a cabinet meeting. Um, we'll be with a lot of the department heads tomorrow uh, and can give them a heads up that these questions uh, will be coming. And then I know we've got the assistance of the mayor's office to ask those departments the questions, uh, which I'm really grateful for. Uh, but my pledge to you, Mary, is that we're not going to give you a list of 100 questions. I'm hoping that we can come up with sort of a narrowly tailored list to ask these folks. So can we do that? Let us do that. Um, so, and I can, I mean, it, it seems to me that it's not to overly complicate things. We sort of want to know what are your current policies or practices related to reporting to the mayor's office requests from federal immigration authority. So let me put that out there as a straw man and then we can edit it, right? But so straw man is, you know, to a metro department, this is about reporting. What are your current policies, practices, trainings with respect to reporting to the mayor's office's requests, to the mayor's office requests from federal immigration authorities? So if I put that as a straw man, what am I missing? For me, I'll be interested in actually knowing the data itself, that they not just the procedure, but what exactly are you reporting somewhere in that question. Tell me more about that. Um, so in a department that is turning over information, what sort of information is it? Does it include kids? Does it include the social security number? What exactly are we turning over? Does that make sense? So, so the procedure to yeah. me will, will look like when we get a, result, uh, a request, we go to A and then we go to B. That's a procedure in my, in my understanding. But the data itself is, should be part of, and I don't know, maybe we, we can ask that, but I would be interested in knowing what exactly do you turn over? What does that look like at the end of the day? All right, so, that, so I think that's probably under compliance, right? So this isn't about calling the mayor's office. This is about when our federal immigration, which is good, I mean, but that's another question that we need to consider. So this is about compliance. When a federal immigration authority makes a request of you, what information do you share with the, am I getting that right, more or less? Um, and Mary, what I would ask of you is if you're hearing questions and you're like, yeah, that's not a thing, that it not right, then please also weigh in so I don't give you a list of a bunch of unaskable questions. Um, okay. I, I mean, I would like to know the training that goes behind these policies. Like, what training do they have for all their employees? Or if there has even been a training. And this is in compliance, right? As yeah. opposed to reporting, not calling the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's both, right? Maybe it can be. Uh, how do you train your employees with respect to these policies and practices, right? for reporting to the mayor's office and the compliance piece, what are other outside laws that the department um, or other entity may know of that would impact that ability? So for example, for schools, we're governed by FERPA that relates to student privacy. I imagine others like hospitals might have to do something with HIPAA and students. So just what we transmit um, and how that could impact that. Uh, okay, so I've got what outside laws does your entity know of that may impact your compliance with requests from federal immigration authorities? That and, and reporting. Yeah. I think specifically privacy laws. So not talking about necessarily immigration related laws, but immigration neutral privacy laws. Is that correct, Hank? That, that'd be additional slant. Well, and, the, and the other side of that is that uh, many of the departments are able to and are required to comply with the state open records. Right. Mm -hmm. So there may be, mm -hmm. you know, 
you're under a certain compulsion to do that. So you've got privacy acts that carve out privacy, but you also have an act, state act, that requires certain information to be made available to, to anybody. And I would also add um, timeliness. What is the timeliness? Once a request gets to the specific department or office, then what are, what are the immediate next steps that are to follow within is it a week, 24 hours, 48 hours, two weeks, a month, a year? And, and to follow up on that, the, you know, the state law has sort of some guidelines in there and some and, and expectations, which I'm sure Metro could they could probably extend it, but they could certainly make it, uh, uh, they could shorten the time. But, but uh, again, that's, that's a good point, but, the, but there also is this, the state requirements for when somebody responds. You're talking about for the open records? For the records, yeah. And who you're talking more about when a federal immigration authority makes a request of, I'm just going to say the water department, like how, how many days, I know, <laughs> like, does that happen? Maybe it happens. Uh, how many days do they have to decide what they're doing and then to actually do it with respect to that request, right? And with that question, right? What, yeah, what, is, what, what is the process? I'm looking at the first piece. Yeah. What is, how does the process look like currently? Yeah. Yes, yes, how does it look currently? Um, Cindy, on that part where we're talking about kind of the outside laws, I just wanted to check in with you and make sure that we're framing that question correctly. Um, so I've got... It's not um, copy edited yet, but can but I frame this actually, Minish? On it seems yeah. like what we're talking about as a, as a chunk of that is what information does each department have, and what protections or obligations are associated with that information. And so I think the first question there for the departments again is to know what information they collect and store, and then again, secondly, from that. How is that information affected by privacy and open record laws? I think that's the, the big bucket here. Tell me more about the have and store. Um, for example, in Metro schools, what type of information does uh, each school collect regarding parents, regarding children? Um, for the police, what type of information do they collect? I mean, every different agency for hospitals, for, you know, Metro Water, uh, what biographical or what information about a person or family is in their records, and then what protections or exposure is that to that information? I think that might be too broad. Yeah. I, I, I think that that's why my question was, what data are you giving to ICE or giving to external agency? And when we get the data, then we can look at whether it meets the privacy laws or not. Our first thing is to understand the process. And we cannot recommend without knowing what the processes are. So the first set of questions have to be very basic for us to just understand what the process is right now. Then we can now go into, we think this process of the data that you're providing is against EPA or some kind of privacy laws. But I just, I think the first basic thing is, what exactly is happening now? And then we'll go from there. So let's make the questions so basic to where the department can just tell us exactly what they're doing now. Just tell us what you're doing. And, and I guess my question then, I mean, I, my guess is what we're going to find is that most departments don't have anything, don't have policies. Which is what we're so, going to end with. <laughs> right. So I guess the issue there then is, um, I think if we just ask sort of what your policy is, I think we'll get a bunch of non-applicable non <laughs> answers or no policy. Uh, so there, there's a question of what is your policy, what is your practice, and what are you actually seeing? And which of those, do we, where in that do we want to focus? It seems like by your question, you're trying to get to the risk of there being information mm -hmm. available or released. But asking the broad question, what information do you have? For us, we've got tons That's of information, but none of it, very little slivers of it, would be relevant to an immigration issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd spend more time answering exactly mm -hmm. what we have mm -hmm. than trying to identify a risk. Mm -hmm. so maybe we narrow that question yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me ask you, the way this is written, though, and I'm, I'm just literally reading it, that may, under number one, scope of work, I mean, yeah. if, if you read, I think, what you put together, the question is, what are the current policies and practices of the Metro Departments with respect to reporting to the mayor's office when you're requested for information? Mm -hmm. That question is very narrow. Yeah, I, mean, I think we're, we're getting more into compliance. Okay, am, I, yeah. am I right? So I don't no, know. No, you're totally right, Sheriff. Uh, I think it's this maybe the second one is probably more relevant to this particular question. 
So, the, you're right. The first one is like, who do you call and by when? And, and what is your policy about it, right? Policy and practice. So yeah. are we, I guess my, I'm, I'm lost because I thought we were going to deal with number one and figure, I mean, I don't care. Oh, I'm we got all saying. pushed up. So we're oh. going to do, we're, I, I'm keeping columns here. Okay. Uh, um, okay. But you're absolutely right. The, the first one really, and I think what we came up with under it is, you know, what are your current policies, practices, trainings with respect to reporting to the mayor's office, requests from federal immigration authorities? How do you train your employees with respect to these policies and practices? Uh, and that, that's, that's pretty much all okay. that's in that okay. first bucket. The second bucket is where we've gotten more into okay. understanding, you know, what are our policies and practices. And I think, as a few members have pointed out, also legal obligations to share or not to share some of that information. Um, so let me just take us back a step. So did, can, just to stick on the reporting for one second, does that feel, and with permission I'll copy edit it maybe a little bit, but from a just content perspective on reporting questions. Those reporting ones, just that number one on the scope, that feels right, like what are your policies and practices and how do you train your employees on these policies and practices? Just about calling the mayor's office. The time frame is also Time frame, yep. What? And I, I mean, I think that would be, yep, got it. This is maybe obvious under it, but I would include also who is included under it. Um, I think part of the concern, and it, it goes along with training, but is that there are different expectations or different levels of understanding from, say, you know, the janitor, the front door mm -hmm. person, the Have school principal, knowledge. whatever, right? Yep. How do you train your employees on these policies and practices, and who do you train? Mm -hmm. or, I mean, there'd be a better, we don't actually want a list of the metro right. employees who are being trained, but like, what category of, is it your senior staff, is it? Mary, do those questions feel on target to you with respect to reporting? Yeah, I mean, the first two questions under one are seem pretty straightforward and foundational. Yep. Um, okay. The so one change I would suggest yeah. is um, I do think there's a question of, you know, there may be some departments that are in the early stages of thinking through this. Totally. So making clear what, if any, are the current policies. Yeah. That's a really important um, point. That way, yeah. that way it gives people permission to say, like, we don't have any yet. Yeah. And the point of this is to do a landscape analysis, right? So what a good starting point. If we understand that a lot of metro departments don't have these, great. Now we know. Uh, and then, you know, moving on, we folks, other folks can work to, to make, help them develop them. But one other aspect on that that I think would be interesting is, as Darren and Tori pointed out, the landscape has shifted dramatically in the past two decades. So I would be interested to know if they have such a policy when that policy was created or amended. So if it is something that takes into account the more recent reality both of Nashville's demographics and our larger political environment. I'm just thinking from a Metro employee standpoint, will they know? I mean, we can ask them. I want to right. maybe try to manage expectations okay. about like, I don't know, I, was, I didn't work here yeah. then. Mm -hmm. um, but and I guess if it was in the past five years or not. I mean, I think we can do big picture. Yeah. Is this a recently developed policy or is this a policy that's, that's sort of broader? And I guess then my second question along with that is, is there any, I mean, as we've discussed, I think it's pretty unlikely that anybody has anything specifically geared toward immigration. Are there other policies that are broader but would be applicable in this situation? Does that make sense? Are there umbrella policies about, like, does MNPS have any time anybody asks for this information, this reporting has to happen? I don't know if those policies are there or not, but. I think, I think we're, and this is just me, me personally, I think one of the big issues that we're, I think the elephant in the room is we're talking about reporting that to the mayor's office. That's just not historically done so on very many issues. I mean, I, I agree that who we give what to is, is with the laws and everything else they're about. I think we will have policies that are pretty clear, right? I mean, the public asks for things. We have seven days or what I forgot, all the mechanics. But what is extremely unusual is to think, notify the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. And I'm just talking about for anybody. I, I can't imagine yeah. that that's going to be in, in very many policies. And so to manage the expectations on that, <clears throat> maybe there are places doing that. In, in the government, I don't think they're going to find many. Mm -hmm. So it's it's two things. What are you doing with the request, and who do you tell about it? Mm -hmm. It feels like. And, oh, and yeah. It, yeah. This seems focused on who's telling the mayor's office. I understand why that's important. But we need to kind of separate the two questions. What do you give when asked by anybody, the public, which could lead to any of this? 
And then who do you tell? It feels like. I think also, in addition to who do you tell, how do you record it? I mean, because there may be places that have some recording of it, even though that is not then shared with the mayor's office. Recording of who you told or how you store that data? Recording of who you told. Okay. Recording of the requests so that, of who you told. To me, it falls under bucket two. Go back to the okay. intent of bucket one, it really is finding out literally in the mayor, yeah, I guess office. I'm looking yeah, to you, yeah. literally in the mayor's office. Okay. So, okay. Sheriff, I think we're probably in the same boat mm -hmm. as y'all. We yeah. we think of the school board, you know, you are the elected official, so your team probably thinks of you reporting to you. So, um, yeah. yeah, and again, back to I think what Tori was saying, I mean, we're, we're governed by a lot of things, but the general public it is literally, I mean, we're giving information out that, that 20 years ago you would never think that, that you would give because it's a public record request, and we do that all the time. So. But we don't then say mayor's office, and we would probably record, I'm thinking out loud here, but we'd probably record the fact that you asked for a record of something, but, and that's documented as a, as a work law maybe, but it's not something we would, you know, I and mean, we could share it, I'm yeah. sure it's not a problem, but I just, I just feel like the questions are twofold. One is about what do you do when you're asked because yeah. of the immigration subject, uh, and then what is your policies okay. about main, managing all of your... Can I just get the overview of what we talked about? I don't know what you're talking about, but yes. Okay, so, so um, what we were looking for in this is, and I've talked to several of you about this, um, there, there seem to be sort of three channels of information that are relevant. One is um, information coming up from departments to the mayor's office, so, um, so that the mayor's office is informed and is confident that um, we're in compliance with what we need to be com in compliant with and also that relevant communities as appropriate are informed of what's going on and that there isn't misinformation that's creating anxiety uh, and fear among communities that don't need to be in that position. So that's the coming up phase. And then the, the second element of it is what information does the mayor's office need to then be pushing down to departments so that, again, departments are informed and that there's a clear understanding of what the obligations are of departments. Um, again, that clarity issue that many of you at the table raise so that Metro employees are confident that they understand what's required of them and what the expectation is so that they can do their jobs effectively without worry. And then the third element is the, the sort of externally facing uh, communication. So what, what does the mayor's office need to be communicating to the public about these enforcement issues? So there are really three. One is coming up from departments to the mayor's office. One is mayor's office information going down to departments and then the, the externally facing element so that basically we're, we all want to be on the same page um, so that everybody understands what's happening and we're comfortable um, that MNPS is on the same page as the mayor's office and the sheriff's department were informed so that we can inform immigrant communities like we're hearing this it's actually not true don't, you don't need to be worrying about that we can try to help with communications um, so that this anxiety and fear is appropriately managed. Um, but also we're very cognizant that the frontline Metro employees are also concerned um, that they know where the lines are. Um, does that help, that sort of three-way communication that we were focused on? I think it, yeah, I, I think it helps. I, I think then we get into this issue of who's under the office of the mayor. and and. And to echo what, what Darren said, I, mean, I can't remember that ICE ever asked us for any information unless it related to an ongoing investigation. But we got constant requests for information from the public of one sort, right. mostly lawyers, but, but other people that we would process. It never occurred to me to tell the mayor, the mayor right. about that. It's not that it would be, <clears throat> I care. It, I mean, it'd be one more step and certainly one more thing we would need to do. But I think that, that if you're not directly under the mayor's office, probably just like we said, nobody's telling the mayor that. And, and, uh, and then the question is, should they be? Uh, and, and again, it's not that the mayor even directs them to do it. It's right. just, do they want to do that? Does he want that? And do, do, does, the, does the elected official care? You know, and they right. might, but they might probably don't. Well, and you've identified part of the issue that, that 
really is why we're here, um, because there is a disconnect in the communication flow because it's not required. I mean, so we're asking, we are asking, since MNPS, as you know from Cindy's presentation, is not required to be telling the mayor's office a lot of things. Um, but on the other hand, the public views the mayor's office as um, right. the holder of the information, and they're, you know, they're looking, so we need to be coordinating in a more effective way um, so that if there is an issue at MNPS or the police department or the sheriff's office, uh, that the community understands um, what, what that really is. Um, I think for now, I'm going to try to move us along to 1101 and we, I may say something yeah. in terms of the, the mayor's office, we can't forget the office of New Americans and that integral part of community members that get their information from the mayor's office and community and advocacy and organizations are on the ground. So whenever this first needs assessment phase takes place and we go to the second pieces, it's also important to know that there are people from the community, immigrant origin families, and many, many of us who rely on this particular office and organizations to channel information and to clarify what is happening yep. between the government and also the communities we serve. So in terms of accountability, I could see also that specific office and New Americans being able to channel information and clarify what is happening on the ground. And more importantly, from a governance structure, how to demystify and make sure that families feel welcome and protected by understanding the laws. So for now, just for the compliance piece, what we might find, as we all predicted, there's probably a whole bunch of departments that don't have a policy about this. What we want to do is arm, whether it's the mayor's office of New Americans or somebody, the right person in the mayor's office, to say to the community, these are the departments from which we receive that information, and like, these are the ones from which we don't because they're a separate entity, but if you want to know, then you can call them. So you don't, even though I think from the outside it appears like you the mayor's office is the keeper of all information about anybody involved in the government. That may not be the case. I mean, maybe somebody has a magic wand someday and that becomes the case, but for now it's important for us just to understand the lay of the land on compliance, sorry, on reporting, on who's calling. Um, but can I move us quickly to compliance? Uh, can, can I say one more thing before we yeah. move on? I, I think it would be important to actually have someone in the position of the Office of New Americans. Um, so I, I don't know where you guys are with that, Mary, um, but, but I think it would be important to, to actually have someone there. Uh, I, don't even, I don't understand what you mean. At the, the Office of New Americans, I what think. What do you mean have somebody there? I think Vanessa to, just just moved on to, to, to somewhere else. Right. So I don't know if there's anyone in that current office. Not yet. Okay. Um, we have all right. a lot of empty spots. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, compliance. So, yes. So, I, I think the sheriff actually framed it really well. So we got we're dealing with two different things. One is uh, what are you doing with requests? That's what we're about to get to. And the second part, which we actually took first because it's easier, is who do you tell about it? Uh, so, and if I can just add to the tanks, and what barriers do you have to telling people about it? The like, are there privacy barriers? Are there? Oh. Whatever? But I, okay, but I'm, yes. Um, so that but, gets into, like, yeah. Is there information that could, that uh, an organization feels like could not be passed to the mayor's office? To the mayor's office, okay. So who do you tell about it? What barriers do you have to telling the mayor's office about it? Um, so what, if any, are your current policies, practices, trainings, and timeframes with respect to reporting to the mayor's office requests from federal immigration authorities? Is this a recently developed, like within the last five years, uh, policy. Uh, how do you train your employees with respect to these policies and practices? Who do you train? What categories of staff? Um, so those are sort of, again, with permission, I'll copy edit them before I get them to you. Uh, but something that we'd like you, your office, to ask Metro departments. Um, and if I may, add, who does the training? Mm -hmm. All right. I want to also try to manage, like, we're, we don't get to know all of the things. I, I want to know, like, so I'm just going to try to manage the, I really want Metro departments to comply to, with this. And I think if we send them lots and lots of questions, I'm afraid they're going to be super overwhelmed. Um, could, do you think we could just ask the, what are your policies and practices and trainings and the way you communicate it? What do you mean by who? Well, which agency, which organization, is, is it a local nonprofit educating on immigrant, like what, what is it? Or is it one specific 
department this is doing just the about with respect to who I'm calls the mayor's the office. Are, are you in the second one? I second one. On oh, okay. Now. You've moved on. Good. First one, are we good? Yeah. First one, we're good. Second one. Okay. Who? Now your question makes more sense to me with respect to who. So the general gist of this is what are you doing with the requests, right? That's what we're trying to answer. So here's what we've got so far. Uh, when federal immigration authorities request information, what information do you provide? How do you train your employees with respect to these policies and practices? Here's uh, Mary Catherine, sort of what you were getting to up top to about what outside laws, including about privacy, do you know about that may impact your compliance with requests from federal immigration authorities? What outside laws, this is getting to what you said, Tori, what outside laws require you to disclose information? Uh, once a request is made, what timeline do you follow for complying with these requests? So that's the sort of the gist of it. I wonder if we even have a basic first question for them. Do you ever get such requests? That's a great idea, because the historic commission is going to be like, no. <laughs> right, I know. Water. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a great, can we say like, and if no, you can stop? Right, yeah. I, think I mean, that's a waste of their time and ours. <laughs> right. I mean, I think yeah. what we're trying to get to is not gonna be in those. Let's make that the threshold question to get into either A or B, I right? Would, and I would expand that threshold question slightly to say, do you ever get such requests? And how do you know that? That's, that's like, I think it is possible that an organization could have gotten requests that were fielded by lower level members and would not have ever made it up to the person answering the survey. Because you don't know, you, you, right, as an employee, if you don't know what the request is, how do you discern what it is and right. how to take it to the next So I guess level. the answer could be, for example, I do not believe that we have ever gotten this type of request. We do have a policy in place that any request for outside information from any agency yeah. has to come up. So is there any structure in place such that the person filling out the survey would know whether or not they get those requests. Does that make sense for us? Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. I mean, and I agree. I, I, I suspect that That's most people have not gotten right. requests um, from... If it came in the form of a public records request, you might not know it's an official Well, and, and that's what I'm saying is that, that there, there are two different things. There's one is the idea of some kind of official request from, from the federal government or some kind of... Uh, um, agreement between to, to, to proactively share information. I would suspect that that's very, very unlikely or limited. But going forward, there's federal authorities could probably have access to lots of different information just because it's a public record. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they may never have tried it, but I mean, somewhere down the road, whether there's an agreement or not, or an understanding or not, they could certainly present themselves at the sheriff's department or the, the you know, whoever, the water department, and say, hey, what can you tell me about so-and-so, depending on whatever applicable laws exist and whatever information they might have. I wonder if almost we make a carve-out for public records. Um, and so say, you know, have you ever gotten requests other than through routine public record channels? Um, because I agree, I don't think that there's much of a way to filter out what comes through just general public record requests. Yeah. I mean, again, I only cover every base we can cover with the, with the question, but I really think if you're saying how many of these departments have had a, is it a called official, uh, a request from immigration authorities, I'm not going to gamble <laughs> on you, but I'll bet you we're talking about less than, than you can think about. And so we're spending a lot of energy. Right to get all that information back to really not solve what I think is the real question. So, I don't, I don't know, is it appropriate to go the other way, which would be, could we come up with what we want the policy to be and move it that way? I, I know it feels good to have, but my point is, we're gonna spend a short window, we have a short window of time to go ask a question that I, I would be willing to uh, negotiate lunch that it's not gonna be very many people. I and think so, that you, the, I think you're really speaking to the importance of some sort of threshold question, so that they don't even have to. I mean, it, and I think we're maybe going to need to wordsmith what that question is. But basically, like, is this relevant to your department? Is the spirit of it? I mean, right. look, look right. behind you, just for the fun of, of conversation, you know, uh, codes. Right, yeah, okay. when you go to the codes director and he gets he or she gets that question, that whatever we send them, 
Mary Catherine's right, except I don't think that person's going to go, I have no idea. Let me go pull my staff. Mm -hmm. He or she is going to say, I've never received that note, which Mm -hmm. is probably the start of what we want to figure out. Now, if we hear and feel that there's there's some deep deep dive in that division, but other than that, I suspect you're going to get a lot of no's at the, uh, the way the question's worded from federal immigration authorities feels like it would come to the director of all these places uh, as the request. Or you would hope that the director is aware that a federal immigration authority asks someone at the front desk. I mean. I think you're wrong about it coming in up top. And I think that's part of my concern. And I think that's what we've seen um, in Nashville is accessing in sort of unexpected places. You know, but would we know that? Well, and that's, well, and I think that's why the follow-up question to do you, you know, have you ever been contacted is, do you have any mechanism in place such that you would know if you had been contacted? Do you have a policy such that does the front person, the front desk person have to report this, this, and this? So that's what I'm trying to get to there is, I know that they're not going to know that. And I think the answer we're going to get from most is, no, we've never had any contact, and no, we don't have anything in place. But I think knowing whether they have anything that would even filter that information up is helpful for us in assessing that agency's sort of exposure. I don't have a problem with the question, but I would suspect it would be hard for a leader of one of these organizations up here to say, "Um, no, and I have no idea what my employees are doing. I mean, that's what you're suggesting that they wouldn't know. And they're not going to say, no, but let me make sure that I don't have a clue what they're doing down there. And, and, and a policy, I bet, is almost zero. That's my bet. But, but second to that, if we ask them, it may trigger codes or someone saying, yeah, I did have someone call one day. Mm-hmm. But again, in an ideal world, you can, you can ask everybody who works in Metro, but we're really going through in a limited time you know, because you're talking about policies, who creates the policies? It's going to be the leadership of, of that division that would know. But, uh, but again, I, I'm, I'm, well, I'm more. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Darren's got some good points. I, the, the other thing, though, that's out there, and I don't mean to harp on it, but so even if they say, no, never had a request, nobody's ever darkened the door, then the next question is, well, do you have information that you, if somebody did make a request, you would have some kind of legal compulsion to turn it over. That gets back to the information. And, and, and be, that, that you would not be in a position to say, no, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. X, whether it's John Q. Citizen or a media. federal, the media. Uh, the media, anybody else, mm-hmm. is there information that you can legitimately, legally say, no, you may not have that information, or sure, you can have it and, and then some. And that's a whole, and that's, because right now we may be finding that, that much of metro government is not really involved or aware or whatever. Uh, but but that, that's not to say there is not a lot of information that is sitting in various departments and big offices and small offices and so forth that is open to anybody that wants it. They just don't ask. So, Troy, is that a threshold question? Or is that in well, the Well, I think that somewhere along the line, it, it, and it plays into this issue, too, of what's governed by privacy, but also ha- ha- Department X, is there information that you collect on a regular basis in, the, in your day-to-day activities that if the media or a private citizen, not to mention federal agencies, would, would be entitled to under the law? if they showed up at your front desk. It's back to the risk. Do you have that information that everyone's concerned about even stored? Yeah. In your department? And I mean, it'd be, if, yeah. if they say, you know, we don't keep anything, fine. <laughs> but, if, but my <laughs> suspicion <laughs> is there's a lot of information. <laughs> then my suspicion is very few requests have ever been made. And the other suspicion is there's a lot of information out there that is available, but nobody asks. So and then the chances to, of the federal immigration authority showing up at human resources is probably sort of slim, but do but but human resources just literally picking it <laughs> the first bullet I saw probably has a lot of information. So do we want them to answer that threshold like do you have a bunch of information that is subject to sort of public records requests or other you know you got to disclose yeah. it and have you ever had a request and if you haven't so maybe the first question is that. Do you have a bunch of stuff you'd have to turn over? 
Two, have you ever had a request? And if you say no to that second one, then you can stop but filling out no the survey. A request. Right. Somebody could show up at HR and ask for an, app, an employee application, not identify themselves as any federal officer yes. or any law enforcement officer or, or anybody, just say, I'm a citizen wanting a copy of a report that I'm entitled to under the Open Records Act. I agree completely. Is, is that, that, that's the key yeah. piece. How does the Next person dinner. know? Yes what to do in that particular situation and to discern and to make the best decision to make sure to comply or not comply or who to turn to internally to make sure that they exercise well, the so, But the thing is, and if it's a public record, it's and a public record. record. I mean, you know, it, you can't sit there and say, well, now, wait a minute, are you with the federal government or are you just John Q. Citizen or are you a member of the media or just who are you? It's just... Part of the question is, is there a third, so of information that's collected, we have some information, for example, that falls under FERPA or that falls under HIPAA that cannot be shared. We have some information which, and I think way more than most people assume, which has to be shared under public record. Is there a third category? Is there information that agencies are collecting that wouldn't fall under either of those and is sort of discretionary the sharing? I don't know about discretionary, but the only thing I'd add to that is, for instance, both the police department and the district attorney's office would have information that they couldn't share at a point in time. So, but at another, at a, at a so later point in time, protected. it would be, it would be That's available. It becomes public. It becomes public. I think another thing to look at in terms of information that's collected is, I mean, obviously we're talking about a lot of biographical information, which is yeah. covered by open records, but also do any of these agencies collect any information about immigration status? Well, that's that a, may be now that's a question. Ah, there we go. You know, that may be the, <laughs> All right, the so that's, I like that because it's not just general information. Mm -hmm. It's about immigration status, right? That if somebody, so we've got two threshold questions and I want to know from an agenda perspective what my pledge to you is we will end these meetings on time. Okay. So you can get back to your lives. So I think this is a really important conversation that we're having and I don't want to cut it short. So I think what we'll do, if it's all right with you all, is talk about best practices from peer cities at our next meeting so that we can use the next 10 minutes to get to some closer place around these questions. So can I just note also yeah. that just the, the difficulty that we are having to even frame the questions, I think demonstrates the need for clear, policies about information and about reaction. I mean, we are having so much trouble even framing the issue, yet there are people in organizations who have none of the access to all of this who are being expected to field requests. Yeah. So I, I if they say, have the information. I would just say, though, I, I think because most of the public don't understand That's how, true. I don't know to call it, I hate to say the word liberal sounds like political, what I'm talking about is how open mm -hmm. we have to be. I was just sharing with Tori just a second ago that the new thing is bloggers. I mean, they'll go on the blog and they want access to records, right? Usually Whether they're the now. public, it's, what's that? Usually right now. Right, right. And so the point is, they're not even having to walk in in the old days or send you something. And so you've got all this information you have to share. We share with everybody that ask. The public doesn't understand how much of that is public. And so it, it, it's going to be hard to get our employees at any level to understand because to me, the ask is this why, and then in there somewhere may be a federal immigration authority if you pick the question. But we're giving that information away under the umbrella of the, what I think is going to be the public records, most of these requests you're talking about. So, but you're, 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 I think the reverse question you asked is, is a really good one. How many of you ask or have information concerning immigration status? So, me, yes. that's, that's yeah, I think that gets to the meat of it. So right. what if the first threshold question is, do you have information about immigration status that if someone made a request you'd have? you'd be legally required to turn over, um, or someone who would otherwise be able to get it under the law. And then the second question is, have you ever gotten a request, other than through public records requests, which sounds like, from federal immigration authorities, and do you have a mechanism in place that would like allow you to know whether you knew that? And that, I think somebody over there made a good point about, they're not gonna be like, actually, no, I have no idea what's yeah. happening at the front desk, but it's more about, like, policy. Are, is there a policy or, or a practice in place, like employee training or something? And my one caveat with that first question about do you, do you gather immigration information is that it can be a little bit broader. Do you gather information about status, place of birth, um, type of ID issued, and whether there's a social security number or not. I mean, there are a number of different sort of proxies that are used for gathering immigration information. <coughs> Okay. All right. And we talked about the reporting ones, and now we are going to spend 
six, maybe seven minutes getting to some good place on these compliance ones. Which, so just again, when federal immigration authorities request information, what information do you provide? How do you train your employees with respect to these policies and practices? Um, now we've got the piece that I don't know if we need it because it's in the threshold one, but what are the outside laws that you may know of that may impact your request with federal immigration authorities? Do we still want that in there? And do we still want that in the reporting piece above? I, I think in the reporting is, piece. Is it relevant? I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I think in the reporting piece because if they're not turning everything over to the mayor's office, then the mayor's office needs to know why they're not getting everything because from what you said, you wanted yeah. to be in sync and know what is being done. But if you're not getting everything, then you don't know everything. But it would be good to know up front why you're not getting everything. Okay, so maybe we keep that in there. And, and it might reporting. be that in practice they're like, oh, what? I think it could even be more simple as, are there any barriers to your to reporting this information uh -huh. to the mayor? Mm -hmm. Yep. I think we have to remember too that this survey is just a piece of data for us to be able to yeah, use yeah. <laughs> and that you know there are experts around the table we can always draw in additional mm. experts with questions we can refer to Metro Legal so I don't feel like we have to write the entire policy via survey. Correct. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay so on that we've got again when they request information, what do you provide? How do you train? What are the outside laws that may impact your compliance? Um, this is again with the compliance piece. Once a request is made, what timeline do you follow for complying? Um, does that sound, again, keeping Hank's point, which is very important in mind, like we're in the ballpark of good questions? Excellent. I would just narrow what outside laws, what outside privacy laws that we're not talking about, like expecting them to get into sort of interaction between state and fed laws, mm -hmm. but privacy protection or privacy, I'll say revealing. I mean, and this is with requests from federal immigration authorities, right? Not the reporting yeah. to the mayor's office, because the mayor's office one is like, barriers. are there barriers? Yeah. Yes. I think we also have to keep in mind, I guess, Mary, this is for you for tomorrow. Tomorrow's department says meeting. We have a lot of, I believe that's y'all's first meeting. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of either new department heads that may be nervous or, mm -hmm. or are, are just getting, <clears throat> building a relationship with you all. And so helping to convey that this is a, just a piece of information that we don't expect them to have mm -hmm. solved everything. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. And um, yeah. So the next, the last, we, we're close, right? And with your permission, I'm going to, take the spirit of these questions, copy edit them down. I need, this is a process that we may be quicker than we want because I want to get it to Mary tonight uh, so that she can ask it at department heads tomorrow. Um, ordinarily, I would like more of an iterative process where I send you a draft and then you give me feedback. I'm gonna go with this um, and get it to Mary tonight. Um, the, the one I think really important question is we saw many, many slides of many, many departments. Is there a category of slides back there that we're not gonna ask, like are we asking Mary, maybe you tell me what's realistic too. Remembering that what our goal is by the end, by December 13th, is to develop a report about kind of what Metro departments are doing. Um, but who, who, which of those slides are we asking these questions to? I mean, the list I have, is, I mean, I, just picking out the key ones would be schools, the public health department, police, the courts, fire, uh, MDHA, the sheriff, um, there are probably others, but those are sort of the key ones that occur to me that um, would be sources of interaction potentially with um, federal authorities. You really hate to burden. Housing. How would you say that? I said, you, I said that. You, you really hate to burden. Well, uh, that's the, also the, why we. The preponderance of departments with. Although there is the threshold question of like, have you ever gotten a request? Yeah. So hopefully if we're burdening them, it's not yeah. too I much. I parks because of their yeah. interaction with kids. Mm -hmm. I've got yeah. schools, health, police, courts, fire, sheriff, MDHA, parks. Judges. 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 I'm going to ask it after we're done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know, for the record. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, yeah. Courts. You say courts. I got it. <laughs> um, does that feel right? I would actually add India, just because it's such a common source of information in general for getting biographical information about people. So water also. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
recognizing that you know, water might say no to right. a threshold question, and then right. hopefully we haven't burned the sky. Probably they will. Um, Okay, I think we've got a good list. I think we've got the basis of two different sets of good questions. I think, Hank, your point, Mary, if you can share it with the new department heads tomorrow, we're not asking you to make policy right now. Our goal is just to describe it, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so again, we're gonna set a review. I really do want us to spend some time reviewing best practices from peer cities. I don't wanna try to smush it into the very end of a meeting or keep you late. Uh, so let's table that and we can talk about it at the next meeting. So speaking of our next meeting, this will be the, the next, our next meeting will be two weeks from now, same time, same place. And then after that, uh, we're going to move because two weeks from that is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving when I am happy to join you all. I don't think you want to be sitting at this table. Um, and we also, I don't know that this time is best, I mean, as evidenced by the fact that Judge Escobar is not here. Mm -hmm. She's always on the bench at this time. So know that, again, next meeting, November 13th, 10 to 11.30, in this room. They'll change after that. You'll hear from Audra. Thank you so much, Audra, in the mayor's office about uh, meeting times beyond that. So at our next meeting, we will be looking at results of the survey that will happen tomorrow and kind of the really quick turnaround, right? But we'll be looking at the results only vis-a-vis -vis that reporting bucket. How do you tell the mayor's office when you get a request? And we'll also be looking at best practices from peer cities. Um, yeah. Is it possible to share those best practices ahead of the meeting so that maybe mm. we can have a look at it when we do come in, then we just go straight into the conversations? If I love that it. is it's a great question. That you have. Yeah, so I think the first question is, do you all have some best practices that you want to lift up? I think so Turk does. Share. And if others do, I love that idea. So Mary Catherine, if you can, yeah, it's a, a great idea. So if you can share them with the group in advance, and I should note one of these pieces of paper is everybody's email addresses. Um, so if you could share them with the group in advance, then we can be smart about them by the time we all come back together two weeks from now. Um, I'll make sure to continue to send the draft agenda the Friday before our Wednesday meeting. So excited about any and all input on that, right? So please take a look, and if you've got suggestions, um, I would love to hear them. Meetings three and four, I told you we'll have to move. Oh, and the fourth meeting, you know, if there are members of the public who want to come and be heard, the fourth meeting would be a good time for that to happen. So just flagging for you that we'll probably have that meeting after work uh, to make it easier for folks to get here. And unless we have other business, I would like to close this meeting out two minutes early. Oh. We have, I have brought, and I know oh. Juliana has handouts. This is also that I will go ahead and hand out now rather than sending around is Turk's a, summary of various policies. Oh, perfect. So she spared okay, everybody so this an email. Is the best practices, well. It's, it's and, sort of a summary of and, various practices. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.